Good morning, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma. Welcome to eSunday at BGF. My name is Bobby Ng, and uh, this talk is being cr cross broadcasted across seven Buddhist organizations. So, today's talk is a very special topic in which uh, the title is Why Seek Blessings When You Can Create Your Own? Let me introduce the speaker. Now, Didi Tan Huat Chai, Didi stands for Dhamma Dutta, Tan Huat Chai is the founding director of the Center for Research and Dhamma Leadership Enhancement, the Cradle, which runs the GLAD programs. Besides being a much sought after Buddhist speaker, Brother Huat Chai is also a talented musician, singer and composer for both commercial songs and Buddhist hymns, both in English and in Chinese. Hua Chai is the partner and principal consultant of THC Consulting Sundaran Brahat, which specializes in organizational development. He graduated from UPM with an education degree and a master's degree in social psychology from the University of Malaya. So over to you, Brother Hua Chai, for your topic. Uh, thank you, Didi uh, 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 Bobby, for the introduction. And also thank you, I'm grateful to BGF for giving me this platform, uh, this beautiful Sunday, sunny Sunday, to share with you something which I thought was very close to my heart, uh, especially when it comes to the issue of blessings. Uh, a lot of us want blessing every other day. So uh, let's talk about this topic and let's try to understand it from a Buddhist perspective. So before that, allow me to share my slides. Is a slide. Is a slide uh, visible? I hope yes, it is. Yes, yes, visible. Yes, Radhi. yes. Okay. Now this is a very interesting topic because uh, as we become Buddhists, as many of us become to be more spiritual, there's always this issue whether we should seek blessings, uh, you know, from whatever sources. Or we should create our own blessings. And what's the fine line that differentiates that? But sometimes when we look at blessings in a certain manner, are we being superstitious? Are we being, you know, uh, not practicing the kind of Dharma that the Buddha expected us to do? So I thought this topic is very relevant for our current time, uh, especially in hard times like now when we're going through pandemic. Uh, a lot of people may be very confused situation. A lot of people may be in a situation where their directions are no more very clear. A lot of people are losing hope at this point in time. A lot of people are trying to find somewhere where they can get back their confidence to live their day-to-day -day life. And as a result of that, uh, blessings become something people is looking high and low and every other day in our society today. So let's hear from the Buddhist perspective, what do you mean by blessings and how can we create blessings? Uh, do we take blessings in this way or do we take blessings in another way? So let's go into this. Now, before that, a little bit of definition from the Western dictionary, uh, it is mentioned, of course there are a couple of definition, but I <clears throat> took out one definition. I thought a lot of us are falling into this category. Uh, of course, there is this blessing that when you want to do something, you get blessings, means you get endorsement from people, approval from people. Sometimes you work in a company, you want to do something, you get the blessings from your boss. That's a different kind of blessing. That's endorsement and approval. But in the Western dictionary, blessings is defined as a ceremonial or act of prayer invoking divine protection. And that's what it is mentioned in Western dictionary. So it means 
it is something that you do. You either ceremonial means you either do you chant something, you pray, and then uh, you ask for help. Uh, and hopefully with the help, uh, maybe your problems can be solved. Maybe the issue can be resolved. And maybe you get what you want. And that's what it means by blessings. So when we look at the definition itself, and when we look into why people have blessings, there are a couple of reasons. I think in general, people want blessing because it is they want good luck. Uh, sometimes they want good health. If they are not in good health, they want good health. If uh, they are traveling or they are in a very challenging situation, they want safety. And that's why people, you know, they want, they want blessings. They ask for blessings. And if things are not in that situation, sometimes they want blessings because they want to get, you know, build wealth. They want to get more wealth. They want to be successful. They want to be happy. And they, they, they do their prayer. They seek for blessings. And also sometimes people go for blessings because uh, of marriage, because of business, because of love, before, and sometimes even studies. Uh, we know there are a lot of practices these days where children, before they go for exams, you know, especially parents are very kanjong, as uh, Chinese say, uh, very you know, anxious about their children. And so, uh, apart from asking the children to study hard, uh, they also uh, uh, quietly, sometimes some parents will go and do some prayer somewhere and to make sure that their children are blessed along the way. So these are the things why people do blessings and people seek for blessings. So now we all want blessings. Who doesn't want blessings in life? I think uh, every sensible person in this world want blessings. And because blessings give us all those things that we hope for just now. Remember, we talk about good luck, good health, safety, success, happiness. And that's what we want, you know. Uh, but to get blessings... Uh, it'll be very interesting to note that people do all kinds of things in order to get blessings. For example, in our society, there are plenty of things. And if you look around how people do or what people do to get blessings. Uh, I've seen those days when there was this so-called spiritual person uh, who came around and uh, apparently they believe when you have the opportunity to hug the person, you get a lot of blessings. So you see people queuing, you know, for miles just to get that little hug. That's what people do because they believe that's how they get blessings. And also, um, sometimes, you know, in a Chinese community, people get blessings uh, because they believe, especially when you have certain Chinese festival, uh, they'll burn incense. And they believe the bigger incense you offer, the bigger is a smoke, the bigger is a blessing. Again, that's what we see people do. And uh, of course, there are people who also, you know, try to get blessings by, you know, using certain religious icons. Uh, they wear, you know, the Buddha image, for example, that it better be as big as possible because that's what they believe. It creates that blessings and give them the protection. And even in people of other faith, for example, some believe they wear certain of their icons, you know, the, for example, the cross or whatever it is, and the bigger it is, the better it is, you know. So some people believe that's how they will get blessings. And of course, in typically in Malaysian context, uh, especially the Chinese, we do seek medium help. And sometimes we need blessings, they go to this medium and they, 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 they express themselves. This is a situation I am, you know, I know my son is going to get married. Uh, I hope I will get a good daughter-in-law so they will get some blessings from the medium. And hopefully the medium will give them something they feel very at ease and at peace, you know. Uh, of course, people do all kinds of things. They pray to trees, they bathe in certain lakes, certain, you know, rivers, they, you know, do all kinds of things. And even if there are things that they are, and sometimes because of these blessings, we can get a little bit more superstitious along the way. Uh, you know, very common for all of us when we say something wrong or something is not good, we always like to say, hey, touch wood, touch wood, uh, so that no bad luck, no bad things can happen to us. And then after that, we, we substitute that with something more positive and hopefully, you know, we are blessed along the way. So people do all kinds of things in general. I'm just giving some example to get blessings in life. 
And in the Buddhist community, we are no different also. Uh, during Vesak day, we also see all kinds of practices, either by the Buddhists or the so-called Buddhists or anybody that comes to the temple. And people would, you know, queue very long to get blessings also. And, you know, to get the so-called blessed, blessed water. And uh, some of them feel that the more they get, the better it is. And, and as you see in the temple, you know, sometimes there are Buddha images down there. Even during uh, Vesak Day, as you see, as they go near to the Buddha images, they touch their head, they touch the ears of the Buddha, the mouth of the Buddha, and they touch their own body. I've seen that in a Buddhist temple. And because they believe such things will bring blessings. And many of you may have gone for tours in various countries and the tour guide will take you to certain things and certain animals or certain you know, things and say, this one will bring good luck. And also you touch the head, you touch the nose, you touch the hands. And I can see everybody is doing that because they all want blessings. And this is what people do when they want to get blessings. Now, people would try anything to get blessings. And sadly, sometimes people even willing to negotiate for blessings. Uh, negotiate means they go to certain parties, certain divine forces and say, if I do this, this is what I'll get and this is what I'll give. And it becomes a negotiation. So that happens also in our society. You know? So uh, the general perceptions of people who want blessings is that, you know, it has to come from outside. When we want blessings, the general perception is we need to outsource this. <laughs> we need to outsource this to the third party because we feel we are weak. We are not able to do to create our own blessings. Our blessings have to come from outside. And there is a general belief and perception and also practice that these blessings must be given by some gurus, by some gods, some bodhisattva or some masters and things like that. So this is the general notion that we see as people practice different things to get blessings in their life. Now, the question we are asking here, and especially as Buddhists, what if blessings, good luck, auspiciousness, can be created by ourselves? That is a question that is important for us to challenge ourselves. And the Buddha, in all his wisdom, actually has indicated to us that, you know, blessings can be a DIY thing. You can do it yourself. You don't have to seek for blessings unnecessarily from external sources. And this is very clearly spelled out by the Buddha in the Mangala Sutta. And in, you know, in, in Chinese, it is called Ji Xiang Jing. So, always filled with blessing and Fu Bao. But then they forget that actually, you know, can that Fu Bao, Ji Xiang, comes from himself rather than outsourced to the third party? That's the big questions. So these questions has been, uh, you know, century old questions. A lot of time people asking, can we really create our own blessings? Or do we need to get blessings from outside? And what actually shall we do to get blessings, for example? So different people have different way of trying to get blessings, which means good luck, good wealth, you know, good health, and so on and so forth. And this same problem of which things that you should do can bring blessings, which things that you do can bring more blessings, is not our problem at this you know, current stage of existence. Even 2,600 years ago during the Buddha's time, such problem also exists. And it doesn't exist in human you know, realm itself. Even in the devas, the heavenly realms among the devas, they also argue, you know, discuss and debate what actually can bring the blessings, what actually is blessings or not blessings. So with that debate going on, they got no answers to that. 
So according to the Mangala Sutta, which the Buddha preached uh, one night, you know, the heavenly being represented by one of the devas went down to see the Buddha, approached the Buddha, saluted the Buddha, and basically, you know, want to seek advice from the Buddha. What actually is considered highest blessings in life? So even, uh, even the devas themselves, uh, the heavenly beings are very confused. Actually, what is good blessings, highest blessings? So they went to see the Buddha. And of course, if uh, the Buddha is like any other religious figures, perhaps he may say, oh, you want blessings? Come to me, I'll give you all the blessings. But the Buddha did not do that. The Buddha basically gave them uh, uh, his teachings on how we can create our own blessings. And these blessings that we can create, uh, it is all mentioned in this Mangala Sutta. And the word Mangala Sutta comes from, if you break down the word, uh, Mang means uh, uh, woeful states, a suffering state. Ga means going, gacha, gachami, ga. And uh, la means cutting. So going the path of cutting yourself from the wufu state. It means you are no more suffering. La. And normally, of course, we say people who are okay, they also want blessing. But a lot of time, people really desperately seeking for blessings are those people who are suffering. According to you know our understanding, the either things are not moving the way they want it, relationship has not been good, business has been dipping, and uh, things don't go smoothly for them, and many other problems they go through. That's called suffering state. So mangala, this word it means to go in a direction to cut yourself from all this suffering. That's what the meaning of mangala. All right. So when we look at this, the Buddha has basically says in the sutta itself, there are 38 things you can do, you should do if you're serious about your own well-being, if you're serious about you know, having you know, good life, good luck, you know, you know, uh, building your wealth, and also being successful and being smooth in your life. There are 38 things the Buddha says you can do. And you don't have to do all the 38 things. Even if you can do a fraction of it, life can be very different for you. All right. So today, I'm not going to go through the 38. I have selected about half of it that I think uh, you'll be useful for all of us. Many of these I've been referring it to it again and again as part of my life, as part of what I do in my life, as what I reflect in my life that have helped me uh, to be, you know, a person who is very conscious about creating my own blessings. And some of this I'll share with you my personal experience, my personal practice, and what I observe from what I deal with people and things like that. Now, let's move on. Let's talk a little bit about blessings. So we understand the Buddha is trying to tell us and especially explain to the Deva which came to seek his advice that, you know, uh, if you want really blessings, these are the things that you must take care. And the Buddha's message to us is very simple. Our blessing is not dependent on external sources. Yeah, you may get some blessings along the way, just like when you have pain, you take a Panadol, you relieve your headache or your pain, but that doesn't solve your problems. The Buddha basically is a religious teacher, our spiritual teacher that always think about long-term. Uh, the Buddha did not try to help us on a short-term basis. The Buddha is concerned for all of us that we should try to overcome our problems, our difficulties, you know, our worries, you know, all this, the Buddha hoped that we can overcome it on a long-term basis. But anyhow, let's take a look at this. 
So our blessings is not dependent on external things. And unfortunately, even today, even the very educated one, we may fall into this category of people trying to seek blessings from external sources. Some people believe in order to get blessings, we, you know, they believe that their, whether their life is blessed or not depend on their zodiac, uh, which star do you belong to, or if you this star, no good, you know, but too bad I'm born in that star, so what to do? So there are people who every day check the horoscope to find whether today is a good day or not a good day. <laughs> there are people who do that. Uh, by the way, the word horoscope, full of horror. Right? That's why it's called horoscope. But anyway, <laughs> to your horror, you find, wow, why today, according to my horoscope, it's not a good day. I better don't go out. That's what it says in the horoscope. So there are people who believe that they are like, who live their life trying to get blessings by depending on their stars, on their zodiac. And there are people also who believe that name makes a lot of difference. Of course, we do believe name makes a lot of difference. Uh, sometimes you get a not so good name, uh, it creates a lot of problems to you. Lah, yeah? And especially for Chinese, in fact, in the Chinese culture, giving a good name is a must when a, uh, when a life comes to this world itself. When a baby is born, what name you give to that person makes a lot of difference. And sometimes the name, of course, but to be too engrossed into giving name and believe that name will give you good thing, it can become a superstition, which some of us are getting into. Uh, for example, my name, I always make fun of my name. My name, Fa uh, Chai, in Chinese, Fa Chai. It sounds like a good name, right? I always jokingly introduce myself to people with this. My, I got this name because my, I came from a very poor family. My dad wished me that one day I will be successfully rich. That's what he wished because we came from a poor family. But I always joke about my name. <laughs> my surname is Tan in Hokkien. In my dialect means I have to wait. So when you put the name together, you say, wow, Tan Wat Chai in English, this doesn't sound that bad. But when you put it in Mandarin, it means I have to wait for prosperity. Oh, it's not a good name anymore. So there are people who believe this. And in the good old days, I still remember in KL, there's this master who helped people to change their name, the stroke of their name. That's what they do, you know? Oh, your business is not very good. I look at your name. Your name is 21 stroke. We should reduce it to 18 stroke. And that's what they do. They find the similar sound, give a different word that sounds quite the same, but with a different stroke. There are people who believe in this, that they hope they can get blessings in their life by changing their name, all right? And of course, some people do believe whether you're blessed or you're not blessed depends a lot on your ancestors. Uh, so sometimes when things don't go well, you always get this issue, you know, husband blame the other side's ancestors, wife blame the other side's ancestors, and they all blame each other because they think, you know, your luck is not so good because of your ancestors. And there are people who believe blessings comes with the right timing. Well, we never deny that sometimes the right timing is important when you should open your business, you know, uh, whether this is a good time, you know, this is a good time to launch a new product, this is a good time to, to go into certain business or not. I think that's very important time or day or night, but to be too much engrossed into this and believe that this is the only thing that you can seek blessings can be quite a dangerous thing because it leads us into superstition, all right? So, you know, among the Chinese, they are very particular about timing, uh, which time to begin the business, which time to get married. And in certain very traditional Chinese family, they are even more concerned about this. They even consult the consultants. And the consultants will tell you best time for you to get married and to best time for the ceremony to be held. And, and then they look into their whatever uh, reference that they have. And they say it's the best time for you to start your journey to go to your bride's place is in the middle of the night. And there you go. And everybody will just you know, have to comply with that. They will start the journey in the middle of the night. 
so that they reach the bride's place, let's say two o'clock in the morning, because according to what has been said, this is the day which is a blessed day. And, but then again, if it is so true, it is so good, many of these marriages should have lasted for many, many good years until they grow old, as what the Chinese say, but it doesn't happen, you know? So, and a lot of people believe that, you know, blessings come if you know how to manage feng shui. Now, I'm not saying geomancy is not correct, but to be too blindly believing in geomancy could be a very dangerous thing. And there are many people who does all kinds of things. I remember many years ago in the early 80s, I was staying in Pahang, one of the remote areas in Pahang, because I started my career very early in the 80s as a teacher for a short while. And I was staying in a house, I remember. That house is owned by the businessman. So he had a few rooms, he rented one to us. And uh, I was staying in the house, the room at the back of the house itself. And of course, the front of the house was facing, I think, the eastern direction where the sun rises. I, I was in the back side of the, the house where the sun sets. So they, they rented out the room to us. And uh, to cut the story short, the guy, the man who rented the house to us, his business wasn't going very smoothly. Uh, so one day he called, uh, he brought in a geomancist, uh, uh, Feng Shui master to come to his house. So that Feng Shui master came with his equipment and was going around the house and then giving some advice to him. Uh, he says, okay, uh, in fact, uh, your Choi San, your god of wealth, you know, uh, this is where he comes in, this is where he goes, you know, he goes out and things like that. And he, he basically advised him uh, to change the fridge direction. Your fridge should not fridge here, you should, your fridge should face there. And the most interesting of all, uh, the advice was he should not come in from the front door, he should come in from the back door because that's where the good luck comes in. So suddenly my room become a very strategic room and actually he can't chase us out because we have been staying there for a while. So he's just advised all of us to comply with him that, you know, you should come in from the back door. And so we all came in, went in and out of the house through the back door. Of course, it was a lot more convenient for us because our, our room is just next to the back door. But to cut the story short again, despite all the intervention by the Feng Shui master, uh, his business didn't really continue to be good and take off. In fact, it went worse and eventually he had to sell off the house and we have to move on to some other places. So you get situations like that. There are people who believe that Feng Shui uh, will bring blessings, but it may not. It may not. And of course, there are people who believe in numerology and to the extreme that, you know, everything in life has to be that. But if you have studied numerology, you would know that actually while well, numbers and sounds and things like that will have an impact on individuals. <clears throat> There's no doubt about that. But if you go deeper into <clears throat> the I Ching itself, you know that it is not as simple as that. There are other factors and things that will affect a person, whether his life is smooth or not smooth. It's not just about numbers itself. So again, there are people who blindly believe in this. And <clears throat> there are people who believe that, you know, our good blessings may come from gods and masters that we pray to. And for that, they argue each other, my God is better than your God. And for that, they argue, you know, your master, you know, is not as good as my Dhamma masters. And because of that, you know, they spend a lot of time arguing, disputing the other side instead of practicing. So, uh, all in all, in short, you know, if you understand Buddhism, our blessing is not dependent on all these things. And the clear direction has been given in the Mangala Sutta, you know, by the Buddha. So what actually, and who actually bless us? That's the question. And in the Mangala Sutta itself, it teaches that real blessings are not from outside. Blessings is not dependent on divine forces, but it is independent of that. Uh, in other words, you can create your own blessings. And blessing is self-owned. It is a DIY. 
approach means you have to do it yourself. If you really, really want to be good in your life, to be smooth in your life, the Buddha has mentioned that there are 38 things you must do so that you'll be smooth, you will be good. And all these things are not cheap negotiation trade-off. You know, if I do this, I get this. The Buddha basically wants us to practice. In fact, all the 38 things in our life. And even if you don't practice all the 38, you can even practice a fraction of it. Life will be very difficult, very different. So we create our own curse of blessings. We create our own good luck and bad luck. And uh, like I say, if we, even if we can take some of this and then put it into our daily practice, we can change our fortune. We can change our luck. And we can also gain real blessings. That's why uh, in the Buddha's teaching, it's emphasized again and again. Yeah? You know, if you remember the song, uh, Self-Reliance, yeah? by ourselves is evil done. By ourselves is pain and endure. Yeah? So we ourselves uh, can create our own happiness, can create our own blessings, and we ourselves create our own curse and bad luck. The choice is ours. And the Buddha wants us to take that choice to be responsible for our own life. So when we say, do not seek blessings outside, uh, why seek blessings uh, outside when you can create your own? And people who start to be, take responsibility for their own life uh, are those people who begin to see, to understand this law of cause and effect. And you know, if your life has not been smooth, has not been successful, if every time when you go and work in a place, you always landed up quarreling with people, if you always do business and you find there are obstacles along the way, do not just simply say your luck is bad. Probably you have not put in the right course. Do the right thing. Practice the right practices that will bring to the light results. That's called cause and effect. If your relationship with people has not been good, all the time people oppose you, all the time people do not support you, all the time people frame you up, all the time people make you as a culprit, maybe you may not have done the right thing to build the relationship with the person concerned. And that's very true if you work in the corporate life. You need to know how to build the relationship with your colleagues, even with your downline that you manage, with your bosses that you have. It's very important to do the right thing so that it will be smooth at the workplace. So that's how we Buddhists look at things. So it's the law of cause and effect. So if we want blessings, which is the good outcome, good luck, could help whatever it takes. Learn to create our own blessings. That's the cost you have to put in. So again, you know, in the Mangala Sutta, the Buddha has mentioned these are the causes that we should put in. These are practices that we must do. If we follow faithfully to do all these things, which means we are planting the right seed, then the right fruit will grow. And when the right fruit grows, of course, it is good luck to us. It is smooth to us. It is success to us. So we have to look at it from that perspective. So as a good Buddhist, uh, the question is, do we simply just seek blessings you know, without understanding it? Uh, that's not the spirit the Buddha wants us to have. The, Buddha, the spirit the Buddha wants us to have is, you must be able to understand the law of cause and effect, that your well-being or your bad luck it's all your own doing. So if you understand that, you put in the right causes. And where do you put the right causes? And fortunately, the Buddha has given us the secret how to have blessings in life. 38 of them all in together. So uh, about this cause and effect, uh, this, there is a famous quotation that goes like this. I'm sure you've seen that before many a time in social media. It says, so a thought leave an egg. Whatever you think, that's what you're going to do. A lot of time, it begins here, which is fundamentally very Buddhistic. 
in the Dhammapada verse one and verse two, the world, the Buddha began with, you know, you know, uh, all are my mate, you know. So, so a thought, <clears throat> reap and act. And if you continue to do the same action again and again, practice the action again and again. When I say practice, it means you keep doing it. And sometimes you could be practicing the wrong thing. You could be doing it, doing the wrong thing again and again. What do you get at the end of the day? You reap a habit. Some people build bad habits over a period of time. Some people build good habits. So whatever that you do every day. So if you're superstitious every day, you build a habit of superstitions. That's what you get. If you, you know, do a lot of positive things in your life every day, you build a habit of positiveness. Uh, that's what the verse says. And it's, it says, so a habit, you reap a character. So if you keep doing certain things again and again, day in, day out, after a while, people can say, oh, he's like that. Oh, Pachai, uh, he's like that. That's his character. Oh, uh, you don't want to talk to him. Uh, he will never listen to you. He's like that. That's uh, his character. Or oh, oh, he's very, very stingy. He never, uh, or oh, he's, he's the person who don't trust people at all. That it is his character. And all this character comes from habits. And habits that came from his day-to-day -day actions, which sometimes have to do in how he look at things. So the verse say, if you, you know, if you sow a character, if that's what you are as a person, that's your destiny. So woman the mingyun. Uh, so, you know, our character, our uh, has to do with that. Our person has to do with our habit, our habit. The action that we do every day. So when we look at this, people normally have a destiny which is not good. It's not because you know, they need to simply seek blessings and change their destiny. From a Buddhist perspective, they had to go back to the source itself, the very fundamental, their thoughts, their actions. That's why when we talk about blessings, we can't run away from our practice uh, of our thoughts, speech, and action every day. People who have positive thoughts, speech, and action every day, their destiny, most of the time, is going to be good. Right? So... How do we create? So you say, Brother Hachai, okay, very good. We should not seek blessing outside. Uh, we will follow what the Buddha's uh, advice is to basically create our own blessings. Uh, we understand from the Mangala Sutta, there are 38 of them. How do we do it? That will be your questions. And today I'm going to share with you my thoughts on how, you know, we can, there are things that we can do. Uh, so I'll go through with you some of this, uh, some of this, uh, maybe half of the 38 that we have. Let's take a look. Now, how to create our own blessings? Number one, remember just now I talked about, you know, so a thoughts, you know, reap and act, you know. So it is important to go back to the very fundamental. Normally, people's, those people whose life are not smooth, when you really sit down and have a conversation with them, and apart from the fact that you know they did some stupid thing along the way, uh, it also because the way they think, the way they look at things, whether they look at things positively or negatively. I'm sure you will find out that if you happen to have friends who have problems, who have a lot of, not only problem, problem after problems, things are not smooth for them. When you sit down and have a good conversation with them, you realize that actually, Many of them, it has a lot to do with the way they look at things, the way they, their mindset goes. So one of the things that we should do as Buddhists in order to create our own blessings is we must, you know, we must straighten our views. And here, if you go into, you know, Dhammapada, uh, number two, verse number two, Dhammapada verse number two, uh, mind precedes all mental states. Mind is the chief. Mind is the forerunners of everything, according to Buddhism. 
they are all my root, you know, it's all my mate. If with a pure mind, if your mind is pure, if your mind is wholesome, if your mind is positive, a person speaks or acts that way and happiness will follow him like his never departing shadow. That's what the Buddha uh, tried to give the analogy. If you keep doing good things with a good intention and good action, good things will follow you like a shadow that follows you all the time. And this is found in Dhammapada too. And so when we talk about, you know, uh, blessings itself, straightening the, straightening the, the views, uh, the mind of individuals are very important. So uh, having right views are very important or uh, in Buddhism because samadhi is paramount to our own blessings and happiness. Blessings or good lucks are just mirror of our own mind, our own mindset. You know, so if our mindsets are correct, positive, you find that many good things happen to them. Yeah? So women way and way, you bring to some good happiness and success to us. will bring you to the other side, the dark side itself. And a lot of this had to do with our mindset. And uh, I have shared this story many a time, but I find it is very interesting to share again and again. Uh, this story goes something like this. Uh, this, this. Actually, this story was told to me by a nun many years ago, and I find the story very useful as part of a teaching and you know learning. You know, and the monk shared, the nun shared this story to me many years ago and says, you know. There used to be a lady that comes to the temple all the time. And uh, the very pious lady come and pray and do the necessaries. And this lady, uh, most of the time when they come, she was not happy. And the nun could notice from the outlook and also the behavior. She was praying very hard. She was not very happy. And one day, the nun has the opportunity to talk to the person, have a chat, and uh, ask the old lady, why are you looking so unhappy about yourself and your life? And the old lady started to, you know, sometimes uh, some of these people, when you give them an opportunity to talk, there are many things that comes up from them. So she started to talk about her life. And uh, she said, oh, oh you know, uh, Reverend, uh, I am not very happy because I got two children, you know, two sons, and they are all doing business. And uh, one of them is actually, you know, selling umbrella. The other one is selling cold drinks, you know, by the roadside, the hawkers. And I said, why are you not so happy? They got business, they got job to do. Oh, you know, you know, I'm not very happy. Every time something happened, I worry about that. And that's very normal for any parents to worry about their children. And in our Asian context, children will be with us throughout our lifetime. Uh, maybe very different from the Western culture itself. The Asian culture, even if you are married to somebody, father, mother is still concerned about you. And sometimes you got problems and things like that, father, mother still comes in. So this is what happened to this old lady. So, oh, I'm worried about my children. You see, every time it rains, I think about my son who sells the cold drinks. His business is going to be affected. Uh, times are hard and this is going to affect him. You know, every time when it, you know, you know when uh, it is a uh, very hot weather, you know, I'm worried on you know, my other sons. Hardly people buy umbrella. They normally buy umbrella when it's raining, they get used. So you see now why I'm not happy. And of course, the nun understood her issue. So the nun says, why don't you do this? Huh? Oh, Papa, why don't you do this? Uh, every time when it rains, don't think about the sun that sells the cold rain by the roadside. Think about, you know, think about the sun, you know, uh, you know, uh, the other sun itself, you know that sells the umbrella. Probably you have good business. And every time it's a sunny day, you know, don't think about, you know, uh, 
the, the sun that sells the umbrella. Think about the sun that sells a cold drink. And in that way, you'll be happy all the time. And then the old lady nod his, her head. And true enough, she went back and she tried to change her, the way she looked at things. And she's a much happier person. Now, the moral of this story is you can't change the rain, you can't change the weather, but definitely you can change the way you look at it. You know, the way you look at it. So sometimes our mind needs to be correct. If our mind is correct, you find that we are a happier person. Yeah? So even if you go through adversity, uh, but people who have, are always positive minded, people who have the right views, right understanding of things, they always can turn adversity to opportunity. So this is one thing we must do as Buddhists in order to create blessings for ourselves. First thing first, straighten our views. And how do you do that? Learn more Dhamma, have more exchanges of discussion about the Dhamma, put into practice more so that your views can be straightened. That's very important. Now, second things that we must do you know, as far as this is concerned is to basically network wisely. Now, this is where I'm going to take from the Mangala Sutta, some of the teachings in the Mangala Sutta, which are very helpful. Now, three things the Buddha basically advised us to be careful of when we talk about, you know, this. Now, the Buddha says, if, in fact, if you look at the Mangala Sutta, the very first few are the foundation for people like us, you and me, they people, to be successful in our life, to have a smooth relationship, and eventually for well, good things to happen for us. The Buddha says, you know, number one, associate not with the fools. Asevana cha balana. And then second one, panditanam cha sevana. And the third one, puja cha puja neyana. Now these three verses, three things the Buddha says, you must have. If you want to have blessings in your life, first thing first, see who you mix with. See who you spend most of your time with. If you want to be successful and you spend most of the time with people who are relaxing and not doing anything, you're not going to be successful. No good things are going to happen to you. If you're going to be, you want to be wise, be with people who are wise and you will learn a lot of things from them along the way. So that's what the Buddha is trying to tell us. So associate not with the fools associate with the wise and honor those worthy of honoring. Now, let me elaborate a little bit more so that you have better understanding of these three simple blessings that you can get. And it is true. Don't look at this line as, uh, it's so simple. No. There are many people whose life are not smooth because of the wrong company they mix with. Not only it's not smooth, those people that mix with basically destruct you know, bring damages to their life, to their business. And there are people who mix with the wise people, the right people. You find that their business grow tremendously. Their life become very smooth and easy path because they mix with them. So don't underestimate these two simple lines that the Buddha talked about. Yeah? So aseva nature bala nang. Bala means foolish. Uh, uh, so, or... Uh, it means young. In actually, in, in Pali, bala means young people who are not matured. It's called bala. Uh, so normally they refer to the younger people, uh, people who have not matured as an adult. They are called bala. So some Indian they give their name bala Krishna means children of Krishna. Uh, those who are young who are, who are children of Krishna. Uh, so that's why the Indian name bala Krishna. So bala nang means foolish. So a sevana means you know, associate. Yeah. So associate not huh, with the foolish and associate with the wise. Pandita nancha. Huh? Pandita, that's what, you know, we, we hear time and time again, uh, even in Malay, yeah? Pandita, we have the word called Pandita. It means a teacher, a wise person, a learned person. So the Buddha says, Sevana. Huh? Just now you got Asivana, here is Sevana. Associate with the wise and honor those worthy honoring. If you do all these things, you find that your life will be very smooth. So be where the right people are. 
So if you want to be successful in life, you need to be with successful people. If you want to be wise, you need to be with the wise people all the time. Be where the right people are. And that's where your networking, where you spend your time and energy every day. Check who are the friends that you mix with every day. They are very critical. Wise people, according yeah, to our understanding, are those people who have strong faith, good values, high morality, and also positive outlook. Important, they are very positive all the time. These are wise people. And even when you're down, they tell you, don't worry, you know, let's look at it from this, this another angle. They are always positive. They are not always negative. People who are not wise, they always see problem first one. And that's the same sometimes in our Buddhist community, we see problem more than opportunities. <laughs> that's not wise. We must always see, yes, there are problems, but you do not see problems as problems. You see problems as opportunity. And the wise uh, who do you mix with, the wise or the foolish, will influence you. Some of them will take you to heaven, that means take you to success and happiness. But if you mix with the foolish, it may take you downward to hell. And that's where your life will fail. So it's very important to associate who you should associate in life. That's what the Buddha advises. And uh, interestingly, when we look at this Mangala Sutta, the third verse, honor those worthy of honoring. Puja means you honor. Puja cha puja ne yanang. Yeah? Honor those worthy honoring. When we look at it from our society today, it means not only who you associate with, do you have a role model that you look up to? Do you have a mentor in your life? Do you have somebody who can coach you? It's very important for us to people who can coach us, guide us, People that we look up to as our mentor. Because if you have one, chances for you to be successful are higher. Chances for you not to make mistakes are, you know, are better. So it's very important for us, you know, when we look at the Mangala Sutta from this simple verse itself to understand that actually, number one, know who you mix with. Mix with the good one, the wise one. Don't mix with the foolish one that brings you down. But more importantly, have somebody as your coach, as your mentor, as your guide in your life. So, you know, most successful businessmen, they have somebody that they look up to as their role model, as their mentor, as their coach. And same thing in the corporate life, you know, those people who are more successful in the corporate, they do have a mentor somewhere that will help them in their career. Same with life. Yeah. So that's what we need to do. So, the Buddha says, you don't have to live a bad life. You can have a good life. You can live a good, successful life. All you need to do, first thing first, network wisely. That's number one. Second thing we can do about this is, after the Buddha says, okay, know who you should mix with. Second thing is set the right and preconditions. So here in the Mangala Sutta, the Buddha also mentioned three things you can help yourself to create your own blessings. What are these? Patirupa Desa Vasocha, living in a suitable locality. That's very important. So the Buddha also says, uh, like what we Chinese say, uh, when your person is successful, he has 天时地利, uh, 地理人和. So Ti is very important. You are, you are in the right place, you know, locality. To have done meritorious deeds in the past, put Becha Katapunyata. Marital is this, Katapunya. Purbe is where the Malay eventually the word comes on, Purba, the old, previous. Okay. So to have done merits in the past are also very important. Now I need to qualify this. When we talk about having good merits in the past, it doesn't mean past life. It means, it could mean this very life. Just like now I talk to you, the moment I finish talking, it becomes a past, right? So the past that we have today is also referred to what you do last, last week. What do you do last month? What do you do last year? What do you do last 10 years? What do you do last 20 years? These are your past. So if the past, you have not been doing a lot of good marital deeds, you don't have the ingredient 
the basis for you to be successful, to be smooth. Everything doesn't come cheap and easy. <laughs> you need to put effort into it. So the Buddha says, you want to be to have blessings in your life, for things to be good, to be smooth, you must continuously to do good things and all the way from the past, even today. And you, if you feel that you have not done good deeds in the past, it's okay. Because what you start to do today will be important for the future. So nothing is lost if you understand this. Next thing the Buddha says, setting oneself on the right course, Atta Sama Paniditya. Now, these three things are very important for us uh, when we want to create our own blessings, apart from knowing who we, we mix with, people we should mix with, apart from the role model. These conditions and preconditions are very important. For example, environment can be both an enabler and disruptor. I mean, you want to sell, you want to open a shop selling luxurious group, I mean goods, and then you open your shop in a very rundown area in the in the town. That's that's a wrong place to start your business, right? So 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 the environment can be a disruptor. And that's why, you know, in a in the good old days when I was studying in Chinese school. I remember there's a story about Meng, Meng Mu San Jue. That means the mother of this person, uh, Meng Mu, uh, he keep changing the place to stay in order for the children to grow up nicely. That's why all of you nowadays, when you buy a house, you also select location. Oh, don't stay in this area, stay in that area. That area, a lot of drug addicts. That area, people are not very good. That area, people are better. You do that, right? When you buy a house, why? Because you believe that locations will help you in many ways. So the Buddha says, yes, you want blessings in your life? Choose a good place to stay. Choose a good city to be in. Choose a good town to stay. And that depends on who, what you want in your life. So, you know, so merits of the past paved the way for success and good things in life. That's why I keep telling people, you know, we must continue to do good things, even though you may have done a lot in the past. Today, you must also continue to do a lot of good things because what you do today become past for tomorrow. So keep doing that. Now maybe we can understand why certain people, are, they work very hard, try all means, and yet they fail. And when we look at it, Actually, all the ingredients, all the management theory they know, all the you know, methods they have tried, all the people they have met, and so on and so forth, but still they fail. And sometimes we say, oh, karma law is karma is bad. But actually, when you look at it, this thing called karma, it's because partly it's because you have not done enough meritorious deeds to support your current condition. So it's important to note that we must have good meritorious deeds done in the past. When I say past, it's not past life, this very life itself. And setting yourself in the right direction is very important because setting our moral compass to avoid evil, do good is very important. Because if this moral compass is not correct, uh, then you'll find that you'll mix with the wrong people and do all the wrong things and things. So people who are successful, they don't have a faulty compass. They have a good compass that always point to the direction in their life that they want. So another three. So we've got three just now, and these three. These three are preconditioned and the right condition for us to have blessings in our life. Stay in a good place, in a right place. Continue to do good deeds and set yourself in the right direction. That also means your priority in life. How do you spend your time and energy every day? That's setting in the right direction. Like most of you today, Sunday, instead of going somewhere, you spend this hour or so listening to the Dharma talk. That Dharma talk is your priority that you have set. In this sense, you are setting yourself in the right direction. So when you keep doing this, let's say weeks after weeks, months after months, I'm sure some good thing will come to your life. Maybe in the form of your understanding of things, your wisdom grow. And all these things become very important when you start to do things in your life, you find that you make less mistakes. 
you make good decisions. That's why your life is full of lessons. All right. So I move on. <coughs> in terms of faulty compass, in the Parabhava Sutta, uh, another sutta, the, the Buddha talks about why people fail, why people's life keep going down and down and down, spiral down like the staircase that we see here in the picture. The Buddha says in the Parabhava Sutta, the vicious people who fail, who got bad luck, you know, whose fortune are not good, the vicious are dear to them. The virtuous, he find no pleasing. You ask them to go and listen to Dhamma talk, I am not interested, lah, you know, why you also square one? <laughs> you ask them to go and, you know, attempt some important, you know, good function. They say, I waste my time. He favors the creeds of the vicious. People that lead them to all those not good things. Oh, he really get very excited. The Buddha says, if you are people like that, this is the cause of your downfall. So don't blame your luck is bad. Don't blame your name is bad. Don't blame your ancestor is bad. Sometimes, in fact, most of the time, from a Buddhist perspective, things don't go well. It's because of our own doing. So if you want blessings, make sure you do those things. Next. Now, the next thing the Buddha advised us in the Mangala Sutta, first, who to mix. Next, the condition must be there. The next thing that you need to have is to be resourceful. And when we say resourceful means what? Now, this is where in the Mangala Sutta it is mentioned. Yeah? Three things, uh, four things, sorry, here. Vast learning, perfect handicraft, discipline, and skillful speech. Bahu Sachancha Sipancha Vinayo Cha Susukito Subasita Cha Yawa Cha. Now, the Buddha says if we want to be successful in our life, good luck, good fortune, smooth success, whatever it is, four things more you must take care. So he just now mentioned three plus three and another four. Now, altogether, we have 10 things that you can practice every day to bring blessings to your life. The Buddha says, people who are always blessed are those people who never stop learning. Fast learning. They will learn things that will help them that matter most in their life. People who stop learning, they are the ones that actually have issues. The world changed. They have not changed because they have stopped learning. And not only that, they always go back to the past. You know, in the good old days, this is what we do in the good old days. You know. And we see that a lot in the corporate world. Uh, people, and sometimes I feel very sad because as a, as an executive coach in a company, sometimes when I coach some leaders, they have given their good 20, 30 years to the, to the company. But because time change, many things change, they are not willing to change with time to learn new things. And they used to be very, very contributing to the company, but today they are seen not contributing anymore. And they don't realize that. The only thing they say is the company is not grateful to them. But when we look deeply into the issue, it's because they have not learned new things. They have not learned new skills. And because of that, they are no more relevant. So the Buddha says, for us to be blessed, in our life, stay relevant, keep learning new things. And when you learn some things, and in your job especially, keep practicing it, perfect handicraft, keep practicing it, keep practicing it until it becomes so good that we're able to do it, you know, and people will know he's good, he's an expert, he's a master. So the Buddha says, do this, because these are the things that will ensure your life will be successful with good fortune, smoothness. The other thing the Buddha says we must have to build our own blessing is to be disciplined. You know, that means we build good habits. You know, if you want your life to be smooth and half the time you're wasting your time, you're not disciplined. If you want to be your own boss and do run your own business, but you sleep until 11 o'clock in the morning, how are you going to be successful? You know, so we need to have discipline. If you want to have good health, you need to have the discipline to basically go and exercise at the right time. 
set the timing, set the date, and go for it. That's called discipline. Then you find that your good health, you always be blessed with good health. Or at least, you know, you're blessed with a healthy body that will help you to do a lot of more things. And the other thing that the Buddha talked about is about skillful speech. It's important for us to have good communication. You know, a lot of people today, they are, when they do business, they interact with people, even in a Buddhist organization, people hate to deal with them. Partly it's because of their speech. And when they speak, they don't speak with kindness. They don't speak with compassion to help people. They don't speak with good words that will encourage people. Uh, so along the way, they offended a lot of people. And every time when they, people see them coming, they run away because they better go away, he comes ready. That's because sometimes it's of our communication. So the Buddha says, have good communication, kind words, you know, filled with compassion to help people. So if we can do all this, yeah, the Buddha says, you know, if you can do this, Good blessings come to our life for simple reason. Knowledgeable people, skillful people, experienced people, they are always in demand, well sought after, and always very agile to adapt to any situation. Uh, in Hokkien, we say, you know, if you are, you have, you are, you are a person who always learning new things, uh, you're always skillful. Uh, in Hokkien, we say, you won't die of hunger because you will always be in demand. And that's true in our working life. And sometimes I'll be very sad for some people. Companies send them for training, they don't want to go. You know, they think it's not important to learn. They always say the younger one go and learn. And they say, uh, uncle, uh, no need to learn anymore. Your young people must go and learn. I mean, when they start to talk like that, they are actually building their own curse. It's not good. They must build their own. Yeah? So, dutiful and positive work attitude brings about work success and abundant blessings. Uh, people who are resourceful, if they follow the practice of Mangala Sutta, there are always lots and lots and lots of opportunity. Think about it. You can create your own blessings by being resourceful. You can create your own blessings by networking wisely. You can create own blessings by providing the condition for things to happen for you. You don't have to seek for blessings from outside. You create your own blessings. Next one. The Buddha mentioned about the things that you need to do. There's another few things that you can do to help yourself to have blessings. Mata pitu upatanang, support of mother and father. The Buddha says it's very important if you want your life to be smooth, you know, to have good blessings, happiness come to your family, to your life. Support your mother and father. Mata is mother, P2 is father. Upatanang means uphold them, support them. In Chinese, we have this word called Xiao Shun. It's very interesting, two words in Chinese. If you know how to Xiao means you are your failure, uh, you, you, you always think about your parents' well being, support them. That's called Xiao. Then when you uh, not ki xiao the xiao, <laughs> xiao, or xiao shun, when you can do that, even in Chinese philosophy, that two words is very deep, things will be very smooth for you. Shun. Xiao shun. That's how the word comes about. People who continuously are filial to their parents, support them, take care of them, things will go very smooth for them. So those of you who have not been doing enough. I mean, those of you still have parents, please do so. I, I don't have parents anymore. I lost my mom when I was the age of seven, my dad at the age of 17, for example. I, I don't have the opportunity to do this. But if you do have parents now, spend more time with them, try to support them, help them along the way. You find that your life will be smoother. And in the Parabhava, Parabhava Sutta, the Buddha also mentioned, whosoever being rich, some of you are rich, does not support his age, father and mother, who has passed their youth means they have age, like they grow old, they are no more strong. This is the cause of your own downfall. So don't blame your life to be bad. You, know. you reflect bad. Have you been a good son 
or a daughter supporting your parents. If not, it's still not too late to do that, to create your own blessings. Next thing the Buddha says, cherishing of wives and children, putta dharasa sangaho. You know? Now, putta, is, that's where the Malay word putra comes in. Children, all right? putta dharasa, a wife. Eh? So cherishing of your wife and children, si ching yen, yuan fen. If you know how to appreciate this karmic connection of you and your family and children and your spouse and your, your children, you find that if you can have, you have a more well-rounded family, you know, blessed with happiness. That's very important. I mean, what's so big deal about being successful businessman and corporate person when your family is in a mess? Think about that. So in the Buddhist philosophy, you know, blessing is when you are successful at work, in business, at the same time, family is intact, is harmonious, is inner, in, is happy. And the Buddha says also peaceful occupation, anakulacha kamanta, you know, zhenming uh, uh, is very important because a good occupation will ensure a uh, long time it brings happiness to your family. And uh, fulfilling family organization brings harmony, peace, and happiness at home. Jia he wan si sing. There's a Chinese saying that say, when a family is in harmony, everything is smooth, everything is upward, everything is prosperous. So again, uh, you don't need to seek for blessings outside. These are the things that within your control to do. And the Buddha has empowered us in life to create our own blessings. But these are the things that we must do and practice every day. If you have done that, you find that your life is smoother. If your life has not been smooth, maybe one of these things you have not done enough. Let's go back to the drawing board and say, what should I do differently? And last one uh, I want to share with you is build strong moral foundation. And this one is also found in the Mangala Sutta. Arati virati papa. The word papa means evil. Eh? So we have avoid evil. Sabba papa sa akaranang. Papa means evil. Eh? Sabba, all the evil. So avoid all evil. Lah. That's what the, the, the word it is. Sabba papa sa akaranang. So arati virati papa means you cease and you abstain from evil. And abstain from intoxicant. Maja panya. Chasanya mo. Okay, this is what you need to do. You need to abstain from intoxicants, things that you get addicted to. Now, in the strict sense, you look at alcoholism, drugs, and things like that, in a strict sense. But in a more subtle sense, it's also addiction to certain bad habits. Those are your, you know, your, your, your addiction. Today, many people are addicted to social media. Today, many people are addicted to phone. The first thing they do in the morning when they wake up is these things called phone. They're addicted to it. And they spend hours and hours in the phone, in the computer, instead of going out and do something positive. So if you look at it from a subtle perspective, that's another form of addiction. So the Buddha says, you, you must abstain yourself from evil. Those things that you get addicted to, of course, in a strict sense, is alcoholism, drugs, and things like that. But in the more subtle sense, those are the habits which are not good. And stiffness in virtue, apamado cha damme su. These are very important so that you build a moral, good moral foundation for yourself. And on these notes, moral foundation is very important because it helps us to open the door for opportunities, you know, and if you have spent so much effort and energy to build your business, to build your career, to build everything, to build a good family, how do you sustain that? I've seen people have built all this and all it takes is one stupid mistake they make morally. Their career is gone. I've seen some very successful corporate figure because they get involved in sexual scandal. That's the end of them. Some politician, that's the end of them. That's because of the moral foundation and things start to go the downtrend for them. 
That's because they do not have things that sustain them. And if you have a good, strong moral foundation, according to the Buddha's teaching, that can help you to weather through all changes, all difficulties. That is why having a strong moral foundations are very important because it leads to your blessings also. Then you can't blame your life is bad. Why? Because morally, you don't have a strong foundation. The strong foundation sustain it for a longer period of time. So I have shared with you more than 10 of the you know, things that we need to practice in Mangala Sutta. So my message to all of us here today, this morning, if you're listening to the talk, is sometimes we look too hard, too far for blessings. Actually, real blessings, you don't have to seek very far. You have to seek within. And that's what the spirit of Mangala Sutta. And I sometimes uh, use this word, you know, so if you are, you know, not beautiful and yet not handicapped, you are blessed, you know. We must learn to count our blessings in our life. People who count their blessings will always be blessed, will always have blessings in their life. If you are not rich and yet you can make it meet, I mean, okay, la, you know, go to cheese and well, I push off. You are blessed. If you don't own much and yet enough to get by in life, you are blessed. Yeah. Be sang pu chu, be xia you yi, as what the Chinese says. Yeah, if I were to compare up there, maybe there are some gaps. But if I compare down the people who are below me, I still got extra. So I'm not that bad. I count my blessings. If you are sick but able to get medical attention, you are blessed. And this sometimes I tell to my children. Uh, don't complain the medicine is bitter. Don't complain the medicine is very difficult to take. And if you learn how to count blessings, more blessings will come to our life. And that's what we should be doing. And next thing here. If you are in trouble and knowing that you're in trouble, you're blessed. At least you know, okay, I'm in trouble. I need help. That's a blessing. If your kids doesn't give much to you of his hard-earned money, it's okay. You know, but anyway, a lot of parents today say, you know, son, daughter, whatever money you earn, uh, that's your state good care. You know, I, I don't expect much from you. Sometimes we say that to our children. Now, if your kids doesn't give much to you of your hard-earned money, but also not asking anything from you. That's very important. You are blessed. Uh, you see, sometimes I see some old parents, even they are 50, 60 years old already, children has grown up, still come back to disturb them, trouble them, don't have enough money, land up with some financial issues, and they have to, even at the age of 60 over, to work to support their children. That's very, very, uh, or can we say, so if you are not in that situation, count your blessing. If your life is like a yo yo but guided by the Dhamma, you are blessed. And many of us know the Dhamma, we are blessed with that, you know. So to end my talk, after sharing with you all those things that Mangala Sutta tells us to do, if you can recap. The Buddha says, first thing first, know who you mix. People, the quality of people that you mix. Do you have a role model and a mentor in your life? It's very important for your good life, for your success, for your auspiciousness in your life. Two, do all the conditions that will help you to succeed. S suitable location to stay, suitable, suitable company to work with. And that's true. Uh, a lot of time I tell the young graduates, the first one or two company that you work with, the first one or two bosses that you work with are very critical to your career success because sometimes that can make or break your career. All right, so suitable locality uh, to have done good deeds in the past and also you know, to be setting yourself in the right direction. The Buddha have told us, you want blessings, do these things. The next thing is to be resourceful, vast learning, perfect handicraft, discipline, you know, and also good communication, wholesome communication, and also cherishing of family. I talk about that. And last but not least, I talk about 
having a strong moral foundation. If you can keep these few things and practice every other time, keep doing it, you find that blessings will come your way. So life is an endless flow of blessings. You know? We must learn how to tap it. We must learn how to count it. So one of the things that if you find that you want blessings in your life, every day do a counting blessing practice either in the morning or at night before you sleep. Today, I count my blessing. I've met somebody in my work and that somebody is able to teach me some new things. To that Miss Lee, to that Mr. Wong, I'm grateful to him. I count my blessings. Do these practices every day. You find that good blessings come to your life. That's important. Now, whether your life is like a cup that you see in the picture is half full or half empty, whether it's blessed or cursed, it all depends on you. You create your own blessings. You create the heaven and hell. So the difference is only one thought. Sing fu he tong ku. Actually, it's one thought away. You think like that or you think like this. It makes a lot of difference. That's why we say first thing first for you to have blessing in your life is to straighten your views. Your mind must be correct. Your mind must be pure. Your mind must be positive. Your mind must be wholesome. Things will get right. One thought, one perspective, one speech. Sometimes you go and meet a client, just one wrong thing you say, the deal is off. One speech, one action will decide whether your life is always full of blessings or full of curses and bad luck. And we can create our own blessings. We are in charge of our life. That's what the Buddha wants us to do. In fact, I've never seen any other religious teacher that empower us so much as the Buddha. That's why the Buddha says, don't look for blessings anywhere else. Those are very short-term blessings. You may get some blessings that will only last for a while. You know, Just like you get a Panadol to relieve your headache. But the real blessings is you do these things, continuously do these things. You find that you, know, you will always have blessings in your life then you can stop seeking blessings outside elsewhere. So with that, I end my talk today. I hope you have picked up some things that will be useful for you to live your life that is full of blessings. And I hope you will have blessings all the time in your life with the Buddhist practice. Yeah. Thank you, Didi Huat Chai. I think this is a very interspersed with a lot of very practical experience as a consultant in the human resources area as a corporate coach. So uh, it is a very, very meaningful talk. The, there are a few questions. I hope we can uh, take some time from the audience. Okay. Brother Hwa Chai, you mentioned about the importance of uh, being close with the boss to, to help you or someone who can help you in the corporate world. However, usually if someone is doing that, their peers will say you are apple polishing. Mm. Their colleague will say they are apple polishing. So how do we overcome these type of problems? Okay, the Buddha did not teach us to be apple polishing in the first <laughs> place. Uh, no, that's not my intention of saying those things. When yeah. I look at the verse there, associate with the wise, uh, uh, and not to associate with the fools, remember that verse, not to associate with the fool, associate with the wise. Bosses also, there are wise bosses, they are foolish bosses. Uh, when we go into any organization, uh, that again depends on your level of wisdom. So that's why you must keep learning Dharma. If you keep learning Dharma, you're able to see this guy is a, wise, a, a wiser person. This guy is a little bit foolish. I should not follow him. Same with bosses. So when I say you must be close to your boss, uh, in, that is said in the context of working relationship. So I, I must make it clear that it's work, working relationship. In general, 
if you don't have a good working relationship with your boss or bosses, you suffer a lot in a workplace. I am not asking you to go and apple fall, polish your boss just to get favor. That's being political. We are not asking you to be political at work. We are asking you to grow yourself, to chart a happy path for yourself to chart a path where things are smooth and you also get to develop along the way. That's what you need to do in the working life. So you must choose, even among your colleagues, there are those who are wise, there are those who are foolish, there are those who are politically using you. You must know when to mix with them, how much to mix with them and things like that. So my answer to this is, we no, the message to you is not to apple polish. The message to you is first thing first, when you go to a workplace, you must make an attempt to build relationship, good relationship, working relationship with your boss. And to do that, of course, it, there are ways on how to do it. Like I don't have the time to go into detail, but building working relationship with the boss and even very difficult boss, sometimes they are very difficult boss, very demanding. But as long as your mind is clear, I'm here to Yesterday, I was giving a talk uh, in the Dhamma Works and we talked about why some people are not happy working. It's because they do not know how to manage their boss well. And when you talk about managing your boss, the first thing that comes to your mind is, are you adding value to your boss? You are hired by your boss because there are areas that he's not good in, their area he cannot do, their area he needs your expertise uh, because maybe he's busy in many things you cover for the area. We must always think that, how do I add value to my boss? The moment you think like that, you are no more fighting with your boss. You know your role there is to support your boss, you know, and to support him well. And when the boss knows that you are there, not to challenge him, but to support him in doing things that he cannot do or he is not able to do, he will like you at some point in time. That's not apple polishing. That's building good relationship. So you should do that all the time when you go to a workplace and build that relationship. Yeah. I hope it answers. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Brother Hot Chai. Question from Sister Zi Hui. How do we handle situations if the foolish one is a sibling and a decision maker towards the well-being of a parent? This is a very good question, a tough one, honestly. It's always very much more difficult to deal with your own family members siblings, parents, and things like that. Now, if we have a sibling uh, who is not wise, as he said, it's harder because if it is friends and associate outside, we can always try to avoid them. But for family members and siblings, there's no way to avoid them. They're the part of your family. You can't say, I follow the Buddha's teaching, not to associate with the fool. So you are the fool, brother. So I'm not going to associate with you. You can't because he's part of your family. So you have to deal with him. So in this case, if you notice that your sibling is maybe a decision maker and he's foolish and certain ideas and decision he wants to make may affect the entire family, well-being, and things like that, the least you can do is this. We must learn to speak out our mind. Uh, so you must present, just like the Buddha presented. You know, the Buddha did not force us to take his teaching. The Buddha says, if we do this, this will be the outcome. If we do that, that will be the outcome. So as a good sibling to your family, and you know your brother, let's say your brother is a decision maker, and he is foolish because he only sees things from one angle. And if he does that, it's going to harm the family by that decision. I think as a, another brother, and you are the one, uh, what we need to do is, not to keep quiet because keep quiet doesn't help. So what we need to do is to be a little bit more assertive here. Assertive means you speak out your mind and says, brother, uh, I hear you, this is what you're saying, this is what you want to do. Let me give you a different scenario. Let me give you a different perspective of this. This is how I see. And you share your perspective. Now, once you have done that, in the family where there are other elders and other members, they also will have to hurt you. And at the end of the day, yes, sometimes in a family, somebody will call the shot and sometimes the big brother will call the shot. And if he calls the shot and the foolish shot in that sense, after hearing your good things, nobody can blame you for not, number one, speaking out, for not sharing your thoughts, 
for not showing that you're concerned about your family, well-being. They know you have taken those things and that is good enough. That's what it means by doing things with your conscience. So when you've got brothers and sisters who are very difficult like that, you have to do wisely, tactfully, but with a conscience. And that's what it means by with a conscience. You have to speak out your mind, tell the consequences. So that one day, your brother or sister who make that decision, a foolish decision, don't come around and blame you. What child? Why didn't you tell me earlier? You are to be blamed. You should tell me earlier. Sometimes it does happen, right? So we should do that so that we will not be a victim again at some point in time if things go wrong. Yeah? Thank you, Brother Hwa Chai. Question from Brother Weili Mudita. In these challenging times of COVID-19 pandemic, economic impact and personal stresses of adjustment, how could one set right conditions in these times and reprioritize their priorities in life? Well, it's, a, it's a big question about life, uh, unless I get a very specific context. But I think crisis and uh, challenging situation like now, you, like any other management people will tell you, you look at crisis, either it is a crisis, it's a problem, or you look at it as an opportunity. I think being good practicing Buddhists, we would like to look at the current situation as a time to readjust our footsteps. It's a time to relook at our direction. Remember, one of the things that Mangala Sutta tell us is to set yourself in the right course. So this is a time, I think, going through very challenging time. If things have not been very smooth for you, things are not working out that well. I think it's time to readjust your life, which means your habits, your character, as what we had said earlier. And how do you do that? You have to set yourself in the right directions. Now, if you have no idea what to do that, that's where the other blessings comes in. Do you have people who are wise that you associate with? Do you have people that you honor those worthy of honoring? Means your role model, your mentor that you can go to. Go and speak to them. You know, buy them a drink, sit down and have a cup of coffee, have a good chat. And maybe they will help you to reorganize your life, give you some pointers, options what to do. And with that, you take it and look at your current situation you're in, in pandemic time, in challenging time to see maybe to re- Reset your cost in your business. Reset your cost in your career and things like that. I, I think that can be done. All you need is now good people to support you. So go for those who are wise. Go for those who you look up to as your mentor, your coach, your, coach, your guide. Uh, and set yourself in the right direction. And look at the list in the Mangala Sutta. Oh, to have done good deeds in the past. In the past, I've not been doing a lot of this. I've been very selfish. You know, I've been thinking of my own career, my own thing. I've not been contributing much, maybe to the Buddhist community, contributing much to my family. Maybe it's time for me to do this so that you start to build good merits in your life. And hopefully in the next one, two, three, four, five years down the road, things turn good for you again. But these are the things that you can, with the, with the wisdom of the Dhamma, you can help yourself. Thank you, Brother Hwachai, for the very practical uh, advice on uh, consulting the wise. Question from Brother Mike Koo from Malacca. Hi, Mike. Hi, Mike. Uh, I hope you are well already after your surgery. So I hope you are recovering nicely. Yeah. Mike asks, uh, how about holy strings that they give out during Vesa? Is that part of the blessings? Uh? And also the water, la, sprinkle water. <laughs> Even the holy water, la, whatever yeah. you call it. If things are so cheap, when I say cheap, means so easy. Then all we need to do and all the Buddha need to say, please go to any of our monks, get the strings, get the blessing water, go and bathe with that blessing water, your life will be smooth. I don't think in any part of the Buddha's teaching, the Buddha point us to that direction. Now, again, I must qualify that so that I don't become the target of unnecessary commands here. Uh, those strings, like the one that I have in my hand here, uh, 
conveniently we call it the blessing strings huh? and it is not totally nonsense uh, you see when these strings are chanted by some monks especially those monks who are practicing monks uh, who cultivate and things like that they are virtuous monks so when they recite those sutta and together with the strings the recitation of the chanting itself the sound, the vibration is power. Always remember that. Sound is power. Don't underestimate the power of sound. For example, uh, i give you an example, uh, Didi Bobby. If I say, I hate you, that word is from the sound, I hate you. Now, if I put it very strongly, I hate you, Didi Bobby, it's very powerful. Now imagine there are 10, 20, 40, 100 people say the same thing strongly towards you. We hate you. That sound has power. That sound has his, you know, has his, those, those, those things. So when a monk recites those sutta uh, in the blessings chanting, they call it the parita chanting, and it, the monks are virtuous, they are cultivating, they are good people, and they take the string for that. Some of this energy are transferred into those strings and is given to you and you wear it. And normally, all these things, terms and conditions applies. There is an expiry date. <laughs> and it also depends on how good you are as a person. I mean, a robber can go to a long paw in any other temple and ask for emulate and wear it. But it doesn't mean he'll be protected from harm, you know. If he does all continue to do all the bad things, the police will come after him, probably he'll be killed by the police. So it doesn't mean he get protection because of that. You yourself need to be wholesome also. Together with the string which has been chanted with that power of the uh, words of the Buddha, it definitely creates a certain aura of protection for you. And definitely it has, its, it has its meaning and purpose there. So I need to clarify this. But those are not long-term blessings in our life. Those are just temporary. So every time you see a new monk comes, you go for a blessing, you ask him for a new string. And I see a lot of people putting tangles of strings in, in, in their hands and things like that. But it's important to know that sustainable blessings, long-term blessings is what you do every day. It's what you think every day. It's what you say every day. So go back to the Mangala Sutta for your long-term blessings. But if you want to wear this, put this on, by all means do so. Yeah? But understand what it can do for you. Thank you, thank you Didi. I hope he answers the question, Mike. Uh, Didi Mike. Yeah. yeah. Question from HN Chia. For die-hard pr prime-timer seniors, very hooked on traditional ways of superstitious blessing hunting in temples. What best can be done? Or we just let it be, let go. Thank you. I think in the Buddhist community, there are also many superstition. Let's be open and frank here. Many practices that we do in Buddhist temples, Buddhist centers, if we don't understand it, it becomes a superstition. It's a simple, it's a fine line for every practice, whether you understand, you don't understand. You don't understand, you understand wrongly, it becomes superstition. Same in some of the practices in our Buddhist community. So in some temples, uh, whether we, we propagate this superstition or not, and if that's the kind of teaching we teach them, oh, come, you know, you know, uh, you drink more this uh, water, you'll be blessed more. Then we are propagating a lot more unnecessary superstition that need to be overcome. So the best way to do, whether they are prime timers or not, they are senior people or not, they are long timer or not, is to education. Dharma education is the best tool against superstition. And that's true for some of the traditions we have in the Buddhist community. We have to debunk some of these myths, some of these practices, because after a long time, if you don't understand, even in the Buddhist centers, it can be superstitious. So I think the way forward here, Didi Chia, is that we need to educate them. 
our duty as Dharma leaders in the community is to keep helping them to understand why this is done. And uh, if possible, encourage them not to chase after blessings. <laughs> there are people who chase after blessing. Every other monk that come, they chase after blessing. Every other monk that come, they ask for a string. Every other monk that come, they and that's chasing after blessings. But in their normal life, they don't do the right things. And that's not good. We need to educate them. So uh, the word is continue educating. It can be frustrating from time to time, but that's what we need to do. Yeah? Keep educating them with the right Dhamma, understanding and practice. Thank you, Di Hua Chai. Last question from uh, Brother A.L. Chan. When a person is handicapped, is it because of wrongdoings from last life? Okay, I don't have the eye to see the, the future nor the past. I am not an enlightened being like some other enlightened media able to see the future and the past. But from the little understanding of the Dharma that I have, um, we are all born differently because of our past karma. In general, that's a statement I made. We are all born differently because of our past karma. Some of us are born beautiful, handsome. Some of us are born not so beautiful and handsome. And some people are born very beautiful and handsome, but not you know, very wise. Some people are not beautiful and handsome, but they're very wise. So the world is filled with very unique individual because each one of us has done in the past certain karma. And because of that, we are born this way. So when a person is born, in fact, to be honest with you, everybody is born handicapped from a Buddhist perspective until we are enlightened. All of us are handicapped. It's only whether we are physically handicapped or mentally handicapped. Many of us are, I mean, what we see when we talk about handicap is physical handicap. But we have so many handicapped, so-called physical handicapped people, they are not handicapped emotionally and mentally. They are very strong individuals. They succeed in their life. And on the other hand, we have many people who are not handicapped physically, right? They are born with a full body, everything is okay. They are handsome, they are smart, but they're very handicapped spiritually and mentally. So I don't think we should look at it uh, that we are born physically handicapped. Uh, therefore, we cannot grow and succeed spiritually. So uh, like I said, all of us are born handicapped, either physically or mentally or emotionally. Uh, that's why we are not enlightened yet. So if any one of us are born physically handicapped, it could be due to past the certain karma. I am not, I don't have the wisdom eye to see what happened. It could be due to the past karma that we are born this way. But we must tell ourselves that's just a physical handicap. What we can do is to make sure that we don't have mental, emotional, spiritual handicap. The opportunities for learning Dharma, for practicing Dharma, for realizing Dharma is the same, whether you are born physically handicapped or not. That's the beauty of it. So for our brother, uh, what's the name, brother? El is it Elvin? A.L. Chan. A.L. Chan. Chan. Uh, I think it could be due to past certain karma that physically Someone maybe like you, as you say, could be born handicapped physically, but that should not deter him to learn the Dharma, practice the Dharma and realize Dharma because the opportunity for that is the same, whether you're handicapped physically or not. But if you're born with good faculties, you don't do the necessary. I think you are more handicapped than any other handicapped people in the world. So let not that physical handicap be a hindrance. Uh, that could be due to the past. Uh, there's no way to change the past. But any handicapped, physically handicapped person can still change the future by doing the right thing today. That's my advice. Thank you, Didi Chai, for the wonderful Dharma sharing and uh, interspersed with a lot of very practical daily experience. And I particularly like your slides, very beautifully done. <laughs> Lots of information inside. Yeah. 